Okay, so thank you for the invitation, uh, both at this workshop and also uh, at the previous talk. It's really a pleasure to be here, so thank you in particular to Matthias. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, I chose uh, a topic cross up and random uh, I know that, that there is an empty intersection with the talk I gave in the previous conference in Salzburg uh, last September that some of you have attended. Uh, but I chose that topic for two different reasons, uh, because it fits, I think, uh, perfectly the, the title of the workshop, and also because uh, I get to pronounce several times the name of Hausdorff. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. So, um, very quickly, let me remind you the model that all of you know already. So, uh, let me consider a K-convex body which is smooth, it has a C to a regular boundary in uh, the D-dimensional Eden space, then you take uh, endpoints which are IID, uniformly distributed, inside the convex body, not on the boundary, inside the convex body, and then you construct the convex wall, a KN of these endpoints, and of course the question is what happens when the size of the input goes to infinity, can you say more about the boundary uh, of this random body top in particular, can you do a close-up near the boundary of the blue smooth convex body and the uh, fluctuation of the random interface, which is here in orange, uh, which is close to uh, the boundary of K itself. And you can do, of course, the same uh, by replacing uh, the endpoints by a Poisson point process. That is, instead of taking a fixed number of points, you take a Poisson number of points and then conditional on that number, you take IID uniform distributed points inside your convex body, and you get almost the same, uh, say for the type that, oh, sorry, what did I do? No, but, <laughs> okay. So yeah, but this is almost the same, uh, say for the fact that now the intensity of the Poisson point process, that is the mean number of points per unit volume, is going to infinity. And, okay, so, uh, my main object will be the Hausdorff distance between the convex body, the mother body, and the random body top K and K lambda. Uh, we will see that uh, we can show convergence to the Gumbel distribution of the renormalized Hausdorff distance. Uh, and this is joint work with Joe Jukic. Uh, in the case of the unit ball, I will uh, remind you a specific technique which is based on the calculation of the probability. Uh, due to Janssen, and uh, we will also use the technique uh, to get some minor results uh, in high dimensional regime. And this is the uh, Benjamin Dadun, the part on the high dimensional uh, monitors. And in the final section, I will try to give you some hints uh, regarding the general technique to uh, get this convergence distribution at the house of distance when the mother body K is uh, smooth and is not uh, the unit ball. And uh, we will in particular uh, derive the calculation of what we call the extremal index, which tells you how many uh, exceedances you expect to see in a row uh, when, uh, when you have one exceedance uh, in, uh, in, uh, somewhere in the boundary of K. Okay, so uh, how's our distance? Uh, I think I need to be uh, very slow on that part. So this is the facet of the convex, the random polytope, which is the farthest from the boundary of K. And okay, so this uh, height, this depth that you can see here, the, the distance between uh, the hyperplane of the section, uh, which gives birth to this facet, and the uh, the closest uh, um, support hyperplane which is parallel to that one. So this distance would be, in most cases, the house of distance, not always. I will tell you more about this in a few minutes. And what can we say about the house of distance? So there was a uh, uh, first result due to Imre uh, Barani uh, in 1989. Uh, which was, uh, oh, I did the same again, okay, sorry. Uh, which was uh, a result in probability for uh, the Hausdorff distance 
uh, it is a theta, that is, it is bounded from below and from above by a constant times what is inside. So log lambda over lambda is a 2 by d plus 1, uh, which is in a way un unsurprising because, uh, uh, well, I will explain where does this exponent 2 over d plus 1 come from, and the fact that the log appears is due to the fact that we are taking a maximum. And then uh, there was a paper due to Brecker, Singh, and Mingham in 98, uh, which solves completely the question in dimension 2. Uh, actually, they do it not only for smooth convex uh, bodies, but also for polygons. And they do it with a uh, purely two-dimensional method. That is, they are uh, going along the boundary of K here, and they are looking at uh, the support function, so this is a process indexed by the time, or the, 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 the curvilinear uh, 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 um, uh, number along the, the boundary of K, and uh, so they consider the infimum over all Poisson points, which are inside K, of the per scalar product between, uh, okay, if X is at point minus X, uh, times uh, the outer unit normal vector at z, where d z is one point along the boundary of k. And they discretize this process, and uh, with a purely one dimensional method, they are able to derive the, uh, the conversion distribution. So our result is to educate the following the Hausdorff distance has the following expansion. So uh, as, uh, as uh, you, you could see in the previous slide, uh, the first term is log lambda over lambda to the 2 by d plus 1. Then there is an expansion with a second term, uh, constant times log log lambda plus a constant, plus something which is random here. So the, the only randomness from this expansion is the last term, psi lambda. And psi lambda converges in distribution to the Gumbel distribution, which is one of the three classical distributions that you may expect when you are uh, computing the limit of uh, the, a maximum or a minimum uh, of a set of random variables. Okay, and in particular, uh, we derive uh, uh, a law of large numbers here. Uh, the house of distance behave like a constant of lambda or lambda to the 2 by plus 1, and the constant is completely explicit. Uh, this is the one. Uh, and you can see that it depends, unsurprisingly, on the maximum of the Gauss curvature along the boundary. That is, you expect that, uh, you can see it even on my simulation here, that you expect the, the facet, uh, which is the farthest from the boundary, uh, to appear near a point where the Gauss curvature is maximal. That's the idea. Uh, okay, and the dependency on A will also appear in A3, uh, but I won't provide the, uh, the actual constant, but we do have it. Okay, so uh, let me uh, now explain the methods to derive this uh, convergence distribution in the case of the ball, the unit ball. Uh, so this is uh, this comes from an old work uh, that, that we did with together with Joe Kitchen with uh, Thomas Schreiber. Uh, so in the case when k equals the unit ball, uh, so just take so it, it's a very uh, simplified picture. Uh, just take uh, the random polytope here uh, in orange, uh, and you construct the uh, Bobonoi flower of your random polytope. That is, you take the union of all of the uh, balls, uh, which are, oh, I did it again. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, all of the balls which have diameter as the segments between the origin and any of the Poisson points. And uh, what can I say? This is also a way of computing the support function because, in fact, in one direction, if you go from the origin to the boundary of this flower, uh, you get uh, the, the value of the support function in that particular direction. Okay, and of course, uh, this requires the origin to be inside the random polytope, and you can assume that it is with high probability thanks to the calculation due to Vendor. In fact, we know how to compute explicitly the probability that the origin is inside uh, the random polytope because the, the distribution of the points is uh, invariant, uh, is symmetric. 
See, this is invariant under any uh, uh, symmetry uh, uh, with respect to the origin. Okay, and uh, if you do that, then if you're interested in the house of distance, in fact, this is reached exactly uh, when the distance between the boundary of K and the, the flower, so we call it a flower because each, each ball is its petal, uh, the, the distance is maximal. And if you fixed a threshold here in, in black, uh, so, so this is uh, the radius of uh, uh, 1 minus a certain t lambda, uh, radius equals 1 minus t, uh, a certain t lambda, uh, you can see that the heart distance exceeds this threshold <laughs> if and only if the petals in red do not completely cover the black circle here, dimension 2. So this is what I explained below. The house of distance is, so I wrote ex exactly the opposite, the house of distance is less than t lambda, if and only if, so the, the, the sphere in black is covered by the, by the spherical caps, so that it is covered by the petals, but you look at the uh, intersection of each petal with the black sphere, and this is a spherical cap on the uh, black sphere, and you expect this <coughs> to cover, uh, this is random covering, and you expect this, this random covering will completely cover uh, the, the sphere, the black sphere. And this is a situation where you have a number of spherical caps uh, which goes to infinity because uh, it depends on uh, all of the black points which lie outside of uh, the black sphere. So all of the black points which are in this analysis. So it, it, the number goes to infinity because the, the <coughs> under n are the intensity of the positive one goes to infinity. But at the same time, since this threshold t lambda here will go to zero with lambda, the, the size of the spherical caps will be smaller and smaller. So you have a competition between the number of spherical caps that you put on the sphere and at the same time the size, the, the, the geodesic radius of each of the spherical caps, which goes to zero. And the paper due to Janssen, which is back to 1996, tells you that if you can connect so that the Poisson number of lambda of caps and the size of the radius, which is of order epsilon, if you can connect both epsilon and lambda so that you have this, ex this exact uh, asymptotic relation, then the probability of covering converges to e to the minus, e to the minus u, that is the distribution function of the Gumbel distribution. Uh, and our situation is slightly different because the points in black here are random inside the annulus, so the size of the spherical caps will also be random. That is, the geodesic radii are random. So we need an extension of uh, Janssen's result because Janssen's result was for a, uh, a covering where only the, the, the position of the centers of the caps are random, but the, the, the radii of the caps are fixed in, in Janssen's paper. So we need a, a, a small extension that is possible, and we can show that, uh, indeed, uh, this relation is satisfied uh, asymptotically, uh, and uh, the renormalized radii of the spherical caps uh, converges in distribution. And so we can apply this result, and we obtain the, the converse to distribution thanks to uh, discovering probability. And uh, let me now... Uh, tell you a bit more about the high dimensional uh, context. So when k is the unit, <coughs> uh, can we say anything about the behavior of this random polytope when both the dimension and the intensity lambda or the number of points is going to infinity? And uh, so I have borrowed here a picture due to Olivier Guédon, uh, just to give you an idea, but you are your, your experts uh, about this. Too. So, for me, this picture was useful because it tells you what you could expect in high dimension. That is, you will have long arms and big holes, and you have a star-shaped picture. And what is in blue here is the weight. That is, if you take the uniform measure on your polytope, you expect that the weight will be concentrated in a thin shell. This is the, the, the thin shell of the conjecture, which is actually open in the case of a, the, this particular random polytope. And uh, so we did not buy capacity the, the volume of the unit ball. 
Uh, and uh, very recently, Gilles Bonnet, Zarka Kabrushko, and Nicola Turki in 21, uh, they derived the result for the expected value of the volume of the random polytope when the dimension goes to infinity and lambda goes to infinity as well. And uh, the regime depends on the logarithm of the mean number of points inside the ball. So lambda kappa d is the mean number of points inside the ball. <coughs> and uh, they, uh, they show that there is uh, here a phase transition uh, when log lambda kappa d behaves like d over 2 times log d over 2 x where x is just any real number, and in that case, you get the, expect the expectation of the renormalized volume, which goes to e to the minus x. Otherwise, uh, this disappears when you are below this uh, threshold, and to the contrary, you occupy uh, all the space uh, when you are above the threshold. And so, the, the question that we, uh, we, we studied with, uh, with uh, Benjamin Adadoun, uh, who was a postdoc with, uh, together with me and with uh, Mathieu Fradelisi, uh, so he was already an expert in high dimensions, so that's why uh, uh, I asked him about this, this question. Uh, so we now consider the support function in one fixed direction, so this is the supremum of x scalar u for any u uh, in the units here. And uh, we not only consider the, the support function, but also the infimum of the support function in a section. So fix a dimension m less than d, and take the, the section of the, the unit ball with uh, Rm. And you ask for the infimum of the support function along this section, which means that it should tell you, depending on m, the size of the holes. Uh, and you expect, of course, m to depend on d, which we, we, we haven't done, by the way. And the result that we have is uh, that we also... Oh, okay, again, okay, this is a rule. Uh, we also have a phase transition, uh, and the phase transition uh, uh, appears earlier than for the volume, which has to be expected because we are looking at only one direction, or we are looking at m different directions, but m is fixed, it does not depend on d. And in that case, you expect that you will be that the house of, that the support function will be close to one earlier than the volume will be close to the volume of the unit ball. So you have here uh, a set between d and d over 2 log d, where uh, anything can happen. I mean, you do not occupy all of the unit ball, but at the same time, if you fix one direction, you, you expect the support function to go to 1. Okay, and we have used Janssen, Janssen's result to obtain uh, a convergence distribution for the renormalized uh, support function, so actually we did it for the, the, the infimum support function in a section. And of course we would like to do it when m depends on d, um, this would be meaningful, and up to now we were unable to do it. Okay, so um, let me go back now, how much time do I have? Um, five minutes, I'll show you. Perfect. Uh, so let me go back now to the initial, yeah. So in your result with uh, Dadun, the dependence on M is arbitrary? Uh, it's not visible. So M should be larger it, than 2. No, it's not visible uh, for, for the, for the low-large numbers. It's visible here, uh, here, of course. Uh, all the quantities here depend on M, but not for the low-large numbers. This is the same as taking just one direction, because M does not depend on D. Uh, by, by the way, here I didn't say, but it, I, I mean that 1 minus the support function is equal to 1 half of the logarithm. Okay, so let me go back to the initial question, which was the house of distance when the dimension d is fixed, uh, but when the number of points, when, or the intensity of the possible process goes to infinity. So, um, since I didn't... Uh, uh, it wasn't clear that, it, that Janssen's method was possible in the case of a general smooth convex body because uh, Janssen's results is specifically about uh, the covering with uh, spherical caps. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is not easy to do the same, to, re to replicate the same in the case of our general convex body. So we opted with, together with Joe Jokic, to, we opted for a, a different technique uh, that is going back to the facets, looking at the distance from a facet to the boundary of K, and take the maximum over this set of uh, uh, this discrete set of real <coughs> variables. 
So uh, what is a facet? This is a simplex, of course, most surely. Uh, and this is encoded by uh, a couple of uh, two, uh, two things. There is uh, Z, which is the support point of uh, the support, which the support hyperplane, which is parallel to the hyperplane of the section, and which, is, which is the closer one. And H is the depth. This is the distance between the two hyperplanes. So with this couple, you can encode the, the, the location of a facet, and then you take three points along the section to build the facet in, the, in dimension three. And, and, uh, <laughs> and we showed, okay, this is a very minor result. We showed that this is not the house of distance if you take the maximum over all the facets of this height. But uh, with high probability, uh, when lambda goes to infinity, uh, you recover the house of distance. And uh, so the idea was to use this discrete set of real random variables, and we went back to uh, the theory for a set of real variables when it is stationary and satisfies some mixing conditions. And the method is always the same. It relies on computing the, the, the asymptotics for the tail distribution of only one variable. So you need to multiply by the number of the total number of variables times the probability that one variable exceeds some threshold. It has to go to something which is fixed to sorry y to the minus tau, and uh, you need some mixing conditions. That is, if you take the maximum over one set of variables and the maximum over another set of variables, and these sets are uh, apart from enough uh, uh, in, in, enough integers, then. Uh, what you get is uh, the maximum, uh, the, the probability of the maximum is less than the threshold, converges to e to the minus theta, e to the minus, two, sorry, minus is miss, missing here. And theta is what we call the external index. So there is, if, of course, if the, if the variables are iid, if they are purely independent and identically, identically distributed, then you, you would get e to the minus, e to the minus tau, because this is, um, multiplicative, the probability is multiplicative, so uh, you, you, you would get theta equals one. The problem is when it is not independent, you, you have this mixing assumption, but still you may have a few uh, exceedances at the same time uh, which are uh, um, appearing uh, um, simultaneously uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for several consecutive uh, variables and random variables. And so the method is due to Ledbetter in 74, and then O'Brien in 97, which, who developed the blocking method that we used. Okay, so I guess I have to go faster. Uh, so it means that if I follow the path of this technique of Ledbetter and, and um, O'Brien, I need to show to the, the asymptotics for the distribution tail of one variable. Only here, we don't have uh, uh, analytically distributed variables. We have different facets. So what we do is we sum over all the facets, and we take a mean, that is, we take a facet picked up at random, like a typical facet. And this is something which had been introduced by Eliza, uh, whom I do not see, but she's here. OK. <laughs> Eliza and Gilles Bonnet, Eliza O'Reilly and Gilles Bonnet did, uh, did introduce the notion of typical facet. And I think it was a work done in, in the Hausdorff Institute or, uh, yeah, uh, during the previous trimester, maybe. OK. So anyway, so we need to have the behavior of this kind of thing, uh, that is, uh, the distribution tail for one facet. And okay, let me go faster. Uh, you can have a facet if the cap which is above is empty. If you fix, if you, if you fix d points, then it gives birth to uh, a simplex uh, along uh, a section. And if the, the, if the cap above is empty or the cap below, but of course the cap below has a volume which is uh, much too large uh, to be considered. Uh, if this, this cap is empty, then you get a facet. And the volume of this cap is uh, when the, the height, when the depth is going to zero, it is equivalent to a constant times h to the d plus one over two. And indeed, you can see that if you compute the probability that is a facet, this is the probability that this, this uh, cap is empty. So it is e to the minus lambda to the, times the volume. And so you need this problem to, to behave like theta of one, that is, uh, h has to be of the order of the minus two, but it was 
So I did it previously in, uh, in one previous episode of my blogs. Uh, so we have this result for the, the distribution tail of one facet picked at random. So I think I will skip the, the, the method, but okay, we, we can do the computation. And we have a threshold, which looks like the final one. That is, we have this linear combination of log lambda, log, log lambda plus a constant, plus tau. So everything is fine, only, only as I said, the, the, the big problem with considering all the facets is that if a facet is far from the boundary of K, you expect the neighboring facets to be far from the boundary as well. That is, you have several consecutive facets which have an exceedance. And that's the main problem for applying Ledbetter's method. And that's why we need the blocking method developed by uh, O'Brien. Uh, OK, so what is the blocking method? It means that we are building some blocks. We are putting, do I have, uh, yeah, not two minutes. We are putting the, the, the facets together inside uh, Voronoi cells. That is, we, we take a certain number of random points along the boundary of K, then we construct the Voronoi cells associated with this nuclear. And then uh, each of the Voronoi cells will give rise to a block, that is, we will take all the facets such that the corresponding Z value, the support point corresponding to the facet, is inside the Voronoi cell. But we also need to build some modes so that we can apply the mixing condition. If you don't have holes, then we, we cannot say that Asymptotically, the, the probability is multiplicative. We cannot use the independence. So that's why we need to build some modes, which are, of course, smaller. So uh, maybe it's easier to, to look at this in dimension two. And uh, when this construction is done, then we can show uh, a result in, this very, in the spirit of what I showed you uh, in the case of O'Brien for, for stationary sequence. And we could, with, together with Joe, uh, express the theta t, which is the extremal index, as a limit, you expect that if you take a facet uniformly and it's an exceedance, then all the facets which are adjacent, that is the facets which share a phase, a d minus two dimensional phase with the random facet, they, they cannot be, uh, uh, they cannot be exceedances. And the big result was to show that the, the extremal index does not depend on, on the, the convex body. And so we can compute uh, the, the extremal index, because we have on one side the blocking method, in the case of the unit ball, on the other side we have Janssen's method, so we can uh, compare the two and then compute the extremal index, and we get in particular dimension two that the extremal index is three-fourths, which means that with high probability you expect in mean, well, I should say in mean, in mean, uh, if you have an exceedance, then you will have four-thirds uh, 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 edges in a row in dimension two, which will be exceedances, which will be far from uh, the boundary of K. And we have the same in any dimension, and trust me, this is between zero and one. Okay, and I guess I don't have time to, to tell you about this, so thank you for your attention.